Hi guys, it is a lovely but a little bit chilly 26 degrees here in the oasis of freedom here in the Sunshine State on this frosty Sunday morning. It is a frosty Sunday morning. That would be January 30th, 2022. I see it's three degrees below zero at my place in New York, baby, so I will not complain about 26 degrees. But since it is Sunday morning, it is time for, quote, my doomsday sermon. This is not exactly, uh, I don't know if this counts as a doomsday sermon or not, but anyway, guys, I have had the great fortune of having this book fall into my lap by this fellow I've read books for him. His name is Dave Eggers. And uh, his new novel is simply called The Every by Dave Eggers, and it is absolutely hilarious. Essentially, the shtick of this book is he's looking at what we now call the alphabet. And, you know, the, the big corporation that owns Google and YouTube and, and, and all of this stuff. Well, this is a few years in the future. You figure about 20 years from now that this book takes place. Um, <clears throat> so this is the uh, description of the book. When the world's largest search engine <clears throat> social media company. I'm going to have to get my second pair of glasses, get my two pairs of glasses to read this. Alright, so here's the setup of this book. When the world's largest search engine social media company, The Circle, which was the subject of his last book, which I did not read but I need to, merges with the planet's dominant e-commerce site, meaning Amazon, of course, <clears throat> it creates the richest and most dangerous and oddly enough most beloved monopoly ever known, the Every. Delaney Wells is an unlikely new hire at the Every, a former forest ranger and unwavering tech skeptic. She charms her way into an entry-level job with one goal in mind, to take down the company from within with her compatriot. They look for the company's weaknesses, hoping to free humanity from all-encompassing surveillance and the emoji-driven infantilization of the species. But does anyone want what Delaney is fighting to save? Does humanity truly want to be free. And this, of course, is what he's, he's really investigating. And uh, he wrote this. This just came out. So he wrote this, you know, since the corona panic started. And he has started, I'm only a, a third of the way through. So I'm going to read three passages from early in the book just to give you an idea of uh, Dave Eggers' writing style and uh, I mean, th this book is hilarious. It's absolutely hilarious. If you have any interest in uh, where this planet is going in terms of the never-ending surveillance state. Uh, so we're going to read about Delaney's, a quick <coughs> recap of her past. Uh, no one expected the, the e-commerce site named after the South American jungle to get into the food business. This is her parents owned a little organic food store as, uh, in Idaho, the little mom, literally a mom and pop operation. Especially not the organic food sector, but they hit the grocery world like a mile wide meteor causing an extinction event for any small store that had the misfortune of existing where, where they, this of course is a rip on Whole Foods, had designs. The Jungle's organic grocery chain, Folk Foods, which is Whole Foods based in Austin, Texas, moved into town and within 18 months 
Delaney's parents had sold their store and were working, whipped and ashamed and wearing green aprons for the chain. Delaney was ashamed too and filled with rage. Her parents had given up. They justified their new existence as a holding pattern. They had seven years of mortgage and payments left, at which point they had unlimited options. They could sell the home and live out any whim, relocation to an Amsterdam houseboat, a year in Yalapa, the Peace Corps in Uzbekistan. They talked rationally and even defiantly about their employer and were, and were determined to win the battle against their rapacious corporate invader, even if simply by taking their money, leaving, and living well. But something happened along the way. Year by year, they became less feisty, less critical of their new corporate overlords. More than a few times they referred to the store and the first person plural. Delaney watched them lose their fight, their spark. They worked 10 hour days and were underpaid. They were required to have devices on their persons at all times so their work hours could be tracked to the minute and where they could be reached day and night for the most minor but relentless questions and updates and schedule changes. They were defeated, exhausted, and worse, they were less interesting because their devices dinged them a few times a minute, their minds were reshaped to the jittery, needy psyche that ruled the digital realm. Delaney was happy to leave, meaning leave home. Uh, she went to college at Reed, doing her best to choose classes where she could maintain some real-world balance. Each semester, Professor Agarwal posted Luther-like with paper and rough-hewn nail a list of tech-resistant classes offered on campus known as Agarwal's Analogs, and Delaney threw herself at those, no matter the subject. She finished with a liberal arts degree and a plan to kill the company that had stolen her childhood and the will of her parents. But then she had lost her nerve. She paled at the thought of giving more of her life to fighting a way of life preferred by her fellow humans. So, instead she became a forest ranger, rotating annually through the Rockies, the Sierras, New Mexico, and Oregon. In the trees and on the mountains, it was an entirely different world, utterly apart from tech takeover, until she arrived at her station one day to find that phones were mandatory for all hikers. For your safety, the refrain went, for it was far easier to count and control numbers and to facilitate rescues if all humans in any park or preserve were trackable and reachable. The new rules were not unexpected and the resistance was scant. Most people entering any park were bringing phones already. The only new twist was the enforcement and registry. After a few weeks, when no opposition was offered, May Holland, May Holland is the CEO of, uh, of the Every, May Holland made a gleeful announcement that her company had spearheaded and would fund the saturation, the saturation of the campaign which she called Find Me in the Natural World, complete with a series of digital posters made to look like the classic 1940s National Park Service advertisements. The Every 
would provide photos to any park visitors who did not have them. I mean, it would provide phones to any park visitors who did not have them and their tracking apps would be added for free to all hikers who had phones, which was everyone. The day of the, this announcement, this call for surveillance in the woods, Delaney was at her station halfway up Mount Lassen, an expired volcano in Northern California. It was then that Delaney was radicalized. She stared down at the alpine lakes strewn around the base of the mountains and she chose war. She pictured a conflagration, a revolution, a burning down. <clears throat> what these companies had done was nothing less than radical speciation. Love that word, speciation. In a few short decades, they had transformed proud and free animals, humans, and made them into endlessly acquiescent dots on screens. Citizens in cities had given up their liberties early in the 21st century, but the natural world had remained wild and people could stay hidden, could move freely, but the last vestige of freedom, the ability to move through the natural world unobserved, fell away on a Friday and no one noticed. May, remember the corporate CEO, became Delaney's enemy, the enemy of all that made humans vital. She needed to be, she needed to, God damn it, these two pairs of glasses will not stay on top of each other. <clears throat> She, meaning May, needed to be toppled and Delaney had the vain glorious belief that she could be the one to do it. But she had no power screaming from the woods. She would have to get inside and start cutting wires. She quit the Forest Service and moved to San Francisco. She took the entry level job at Old Factory. <clears throat> like Dan Faraday, VJ, and Martin were tricked by her exotic background and though she liked her co-workers, liked them a great deal, in fact, there was an apocalyptic obedience at play there that she did not know if she could reverse. She and all staff had to acquiesce to trackers that consumed their hours their minutes, their keystrokes, and measured their productivity. Merits were daisies, demerits were durian fruit. Day to day, the consequences were minimal and seldom spoken. It was only when there was an assessment or dismissal that the data was awakened then everything the underperforming employee had ever said or done was unearthed and examined and compared to averages, aggregates, standards, and expectations. <clears throat> Her employers would see the data and shrug, would smile apologetically, helplessly. It was not. They were keen to emphasize their decision. While at Old Factory, while planning her side assault on the Every, the final straw for Delaney was nothing involving the consolidation of wealth and power made possible through mass surveillance and the numerification of lives. It was a message from her father. Sad news, Dell. Grandma Juju died last night. <clears throat> this message was followed by a tiny yellow face looking like a Pac-Man in a frontal view with waterfalls of tears flowing from its wee eyes. Seconds later, her mother seconded the message. 
so sad she wrote you know about the death of her own mother so sad she wrote and punctuated this with a slight variation on the first emoji this yellow face was crying too but had little arms extended from its round body and these hands were formed into fists that were trying to stem the tears her mother followed this face with the words she was a sweetie and this statement was helped by yet another tiny animated emoji a cartoon grandmother tilting back and forth in a motion meant to be either rocking or dancing Delaney's devastation was many layered she would never be able to correct this moment the news of her grandmother's passing not delivered by tearful phone call or in person or in a way fitting of thousands of years of human evolution toward increasing refinement <clears throat> this news of her grandmother's death was delivered by weeping Pac-Man when Delaney confronted her parents they could not recognize <clears throat> the transgression they pointed out correctly Delaney had to admit that Grandma Juju loved emojis too and uh, for the record guys I have never in my entire life sent an emoji I am offended by the very concept of emojis I find them absolutely offensive the infantilization of the human race as Dave Eggers calls them I noticed that more and more emojis are appearing in the comments at Collapse Chronicles I will kindly ask people to stop sending emojis to Collapse Chronicles you are embarrassing yourself anyway we're going to read one more section because I think uh, <clears throat> this mentions the corona panic. This is where the corona panic uh, and the passports and whatnot have uh, turned into in the next 20 years or so. So anyway, so Delaney is now uh, getting into uh, <clears throat> an, her entry level job and she has to go get her physical which of course is not done by a human doctor but by a robot doctor so this is what happens when uh, when uh, she is goes in for her physical remember that May <clears throat> is the uh, CEO of this whole corporation so I'm going to read one more section out of this book the rest of her intake was unsurprising because Delaney's medical history was already digitized the every simply had to add her data to their own database and update a few metrics as the med bed that's right the bed itself scanned her as the med bed scanner Delaney cycled through the possibilities it seemed highly improbable that there was another may oh I'm, I'm sorry what happened was I forgot so anyway what had happened was when she first got into the room uh, there was a screen and what it showed was a fetus was a developing fetus <laughs> on the screen and it had May Holland's name it was up there for about three seconds and then the screen went black so uh, she had the news that May Holland uh, who's basically Jeff Bezos but a female version was pregnant and she was trying to figure out if this was for real or if this was a trap <clears throat> all right uh, as the med bed scanner Delaney cycled <coughs> through the possibilities about why she was allowed to see this screen about uh, May being pregnant 
it seemed highly improbable that there was another Maybelline Holland on the campus, but it also seemed unlikely that the CEO of the Every would have used this nondescript med bed, let alone leave this most personal information on screen for the next visitor to find. Above all, it was impossible that May Holland was pregnant. Her life was lived with unrivaled transparency. She was still fully seen with a capital S. To be true to those principles of the scene, she would have broadcast her first visit to any doctor, her first knowledge of her pregnancy. God damn it! Uh, her first knowledge of her pregnancy, anything less, would have bred suspicion, would perpetuate corrosive secrecy. And, it, and beyond that was the issue of the carbon impact. Yes, population growth activists had become more vocal. Yeah, so this is probably around 2050. Finally, finally, population growth activists had become more vocal and their questions, must you, should you, have you any right, you know, to have children, were seeping into the mainstream. Yes, if anyone would debate these questions openly and seek a kind of customer consensus about her own baby making, it would be the face of the every. So she could not be pregnant. That, it, that embryo being truly inside May Holland just was not possible. But Delaney had no way to find out. It was one of the few pieces of medical data still outside the right to know laws, you know, that are being, you know, the right to know laws, which are exactly the laws being uh, born today with these passports, in case you do not know what these passports are about. During the second pandemic, okay, so we had the corona panic, remember, during the second pandemic, new laws were rushed through all over the world, giving all citizens the right to know who had a virus and where they likely got it. It only seemed right and contributed to the general well-being and slowing of the spread of the virus. Yes, and what about lice and mono? HIV, herpes, no one had a right to spread these afflictions. Pink eye, and everyone had a right to know who was afflicted. Public registries became the norm, and the idea of keeping medical information private became indefensible. It put others at risk and thwarted scientific progress. Yes, but pregnancies were still secret and the law treated them as such. Delaney could not even search May Holland pregnant because the typer of those words would immediately be known. The second wave, you know, after the second pandemic, the second wave of the right to know laws had codified a person's right to know in real time who was searching for them and what information they sought. The searcher, to be sure, also had the right to know who was watching their searches, creating a two-way mirror effect which occurred a billion times every day of a searcher searching while the search watched the searcher searching them. <clears throat> Could Wes, this is her pseudo-boyfriend, Could Wes do the search, Delaney wondered? And if this was indeed the truth that May was carrying a child, she had concealed it. 
And if the head of the every had purposely hidden disinformation, how could Wes access it? If anyone could find a way he could, he had all the necessary tools of a hacker. But his brain was strange too. His was a non-linear mind that found back doors and side doors and crevices and cracks that would not occur to anyone else. Okay, all set. Dr. Villa Bobo's, that's the name of the table, Dr. Villa Bobo. Okay, all set. Dr. Villa Bobo's recorded self said. Delaney got dressed and while buttoning her shirt had a series of thoughts, none of them more rational than any other. <clears throat> she thought this could be a setup, a test of how she would handle such sensitive information. But if so, there was no correct response. Such a private matter should have been private in the first place. This was the unnecessarily awkward position May herself had sought to eliminate. The keeping of secrets, the sowing of distrust and fostering of conspiracies. Delaney had no choice really but to wait <clears throat> as unorthodox as it was, perhaps May was simply waiting for the right time to reveal that she was bringing another human into the world. <laughs> anyway, guys, uh, this goes on and on. And as I say, I'm only just beginning this book. It, 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 this is spot on. And uh, what's creepy about this book, I mean, what sounds funny and far-fetched, you know, on what, there's nothing funny about it. Uh, this is exactly where we are heading with the, you know, with these, these passports and, uh, and, 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 and all of this stuff. Make no mistake what the surveillance state is lining up for this planet with this latest little episode, the first pandemic. Anyway, it is a gorgeous day and we need to head out into the swampland to look for more swampland to flip to clueless morons before it all goes underwater. Anyway, The Every by Dave Eggers. Two thumbs up. Bye, guys.